Leonard Toes lived the good life. He made millions in the trucking business and cut a dashing figure in Philadelphia society. But his dream was to own a football team, and in 1969, he bought the Eagles for $16 million. When he touched down in his private helicopter, he didn't know what he was getting into. Stupid damn field goal. I could kick it that far. And the NFL didn't know what it was getting into either. We used to meet at 410 Park Avenue in the conference room, and uh, we all sat in, in classroom-type chairs with little armrests for writing. You felt like, you know, you were in school again. You crowded together, and so I ordered a big chair for myself. Rolled down this big green overstuffed chair down Park Avenue and brought it up through the freight elevator so he can sit and comfort our meetings. I, I was Leonard. If you can't go first class, stay home. That's my theory. He had uh, the Mercedes limousine, and every limousine I've ever seen in my life had the tinted glass, so you can't see who's in it. But he didn't have tinted glass. I mean, he had that glass that you knew was Leonard Toes in the limousine. While he lived the limo life, um, he wasn't particularly snobbish or aloof at all. I mean, he was very approachable. I mean, wherever he left, there was a wake of $100 bills. Uh, coat check ladies, waiters, uh, head waiters, whatever. He loved, he absolutely loved people. Absolutely loved people. His generosity saved high school football in Philadelphia and helped save lives in the city's police department. But his main charity involvement began within the Eagles family with Fred Hill, number 86. How did the Eagles fly for leukemia start? It started by Fred Hill knocking on the door of my office, coming in in tears. He said, my daughter has leukemia. I didn't know what leukemia was. Nobody talked about it. I said to Fred, I'm going to give you the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm going to give you Veterans Stadium. I'm going to give you anything that I have. Leonard Toes, whatever he has is at your disposal. Let's go attack it. And he sent me to Audrey Evans. And when I went to her, I said, Dr. Evans, Jim Murray, Philadelphia Eagles. She said, what are they? I had no idea, <laughs> you know, but when I said I had cash, she said, welcome to Jimmy, come on in. And she came up with this list that we took back to Leonard Toast. And we were only expecting to do one thing on the list. So when he said, well, we'll do it, I, I, I wondered, well, which one is he talking about? You know, is it one of the larger ones or one of the small ones? It never occurred to me that he meant we'll do the list. With Toast's initial pledge of $1 million, Eagles Fly for Leukemia was born. The entire Eagle organization became involved in a fundraising effort that helped build a bone marrow transplant unit at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Everybody called up and they said, how can we help Eagles fly for leukemia? And it was just like the whole city got involved and out of it just came, you know, tremendous things for not only charity but just humanity. Phase two was creation of the Ronald McDonald House where families live at little or no cost while their children undergo treatment. The first house opened in Philadelphia and the idea spread around the world with the support of McDonald's and Leonard Toes. Leonard's great battle cry is we will get rid of leukemia. How can you not help kids? Most of this, the, the leukemia strikes kids. Oh, he's gonna cure them all. Or he's gonna help us cure them all, and uh, may that be true. Leonard Toes made his team a leader in the community, and he tried just as hard to make the Eagles a leader on the field. Starting today, you've got a real shot to make football history. I say, lay it to them, stay loose, and good luck. Before games, he, he brought in some Frank, Frank Sinatra records for us to to, uh, to listen to. Now, I like Frank Sinatra. I'm a big fan of his. I love listening to him, but not on game day. Toes tried everything, including changing head coaches three times in five years. He even borrowed an idea from Joe Namath and guaranteed a win over the New York Giants. He stated in the press that we will beat the Giants. Now, I'm not sure what kind of game plan he had going in, but he guaranteed victory. Guaranteed. That was the words in the headlines. Well, we went out and proceeded to hold them down to 62 to 10. Didn't really know where we were going from there except downhill. There were many quality people 
who sought the head coaching job of the Eagles. But no one impressed us as much as Dick Vermeil. A decade of Eagle frustration ended with the arrival of Dick Vermeil. And as Leonard Toes was hiring his fourth head coach, he met the woman who became his third wife. I was working the flight uh, in first class, and I walked by and he said, Lady, you have a beautiful ass. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and I said, I think you're somebody I ought to know. So that's how we met. But Leonard Toes' honeymoon with the Philadelphia fans was long since over. In his first nine years as owner, the Eagles did not have a single winning season. Things just went from bad to worse. We were lousy. We were very undisciplined. We were not pros. That's what it came down to. And uh, Dick Vermeil said, we get some pros around here. I mean, you got some talent, but you don't have any pros. He was doing everything on the fly and, and, and just making players tougher and, and uh, better conditioned and more of a team-like atmosphere. I just think we're, uh, everything we're doing is going in the right direction and, and one day you're going to be very proud of this whole legal organization. Vermeil traded for a young quarterback named Ron Jaworski and rebuilt around players like wide receiver Harold Carmichael and running back Wilbert Montgomery. The team took on the hard-driving personality of its coach and its fortunes finally changed. In 1978, as Leonard Toes underwent open-heart surgery in Houston, the Eagles played the ultimate heart stopper in New York. So he's walking over to the bathroom and he says to me, Leonard said, it's, you know, this is awful. We're done. It's over. I'm trying to think, oh, I got to fly back to Houston and tell him why we lost. Pazarczyk can just fall on the football and Pazarczyk fumbles the football. It's picked up by Herman Edwards. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I mean, Herman Edwards is running towards me and it's like slow motion. My mind couldn't grasp it. And then all at once, Bergy, I mean, it was like a rugby match, a scrum. Everybody's piled all over each other. Meanwhile, segue back to Houston, Sam says it's like code blue. We are screaming in this room. Well, I was like code nine. I mean, the buzzers were going. And all the doctors came in the room, thought I was really dying. Merle's saying, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And uh, that was the miracle. I remember the 78 season, and, and our goal was just to be a winner, just to be a winner. Thinking about being a winner. Being a winner. Just be a winner. Well, guys, 12 years, 12 years have gone by since the Eagles have been a winner. We're, we're going to come out winners today. First and goal for the Eagles are in the Giants' seventh. To Montgomery, up the middle, touchdown, Eagles! Eagles! Finally, you reach the pinnacle of what you set out for and be a damn winner, and it happened. You know, I, my chest was bursting out, and my eyes were welled up, and I felt so darn good that we had accomplished it. Eagles are winners, honey! The Eagles are winners! And the first guy that I see when I come in the locker is Leonard Toes waiting there with his arms out, and I mean, hey, and it was, hey, you know, now you're a winner. I was a high school coach at Hillsdale High School in 1960, and all of a sudden here I am coaching the National Football League in a very important game. And I felt Leonard Toes was responsible for that opportunity. In some ways, Dick was a son that Leonard never had. Dick put more heart and soul into that job. Leonard could relate to that. It was a working class team, it was a dock workers team, and it sort of reflected not only Vermeil's work ethic, but Leonard's, you know, from a, coming from a trucking family. He had a toughness about him in a way. The city was having a love affair with Leonard, with Dick, with our cheerleaders, with everything. Now this game ball, guys, uh, I'm gonna give this to the city of Philadelphia. We were the kumbaya team, we were the moonies, we were the huggers, but it was real. He loved the game. He loved uh, being the center of attention in Philadelphia. Uh, loved trying to do something for the city. He felt one way he could really help Philadelphia was bring them a winner. In 1980, 
The Eagles of Toes and Vermeil brought Philadelphia its first division championship in 20 years. <laughs> That's the greatest show of my life. <laughs> Etched in my mind is the scene between Jim Murray, the general manager, and Leonard hugging and then Vermeil coming in there. It's something I'll never forget. And then the guy that makes it all possible is this guy that dresses pretty nice and lives pretty good. And just got married. And to Mr. Toast and his bride, you are now a champion. Well, I can say it was one hell of a wedding present. He was the Toast of Philadelphia. And uh, I, mean, he, he, I think he probably could have bathed in champagne, but I know he was bathing in the applause. And he deserved it. He deserved to be the guy that was the toast of the town. On a frigid January day, the hopes of an entire city rode on Dick Vermeil and the team he had molded into family. The Eagles taught the Cowboys that a team and a town united in a cause can overcome any odds. There's no question that the Super Bowl was a real negative in Leonard's life, and maybe a percentage of his downfall. But I think even more so was the strike. We were the kind of organization that really needed that cash flow, those gain receipts to pay the bills, and they weren't coming in. I think that really, really got to him. In fact, the most depressed I've ever seen him was after our first game back, we played the Cincinnati Bengals after the strike at home, and we lost. And he came in the locker room after the ball game, and he really ripped the team. Leonard comes out and says, I wish you guys would go back out on strike. Do the city a favor. That hurt. And I remember my immediate reaction was to go after him. And, and, and I remember guys kind of holding me back because I, I felt that his comments were totally out of line. It was a, a, a picture of frustration, a man that was in trouble financially, in trouble uh, emotionally. That hurt me. It hurt the rest of the team. And I don't know if he really meant it, but that was his reaction at the time, and uh, it hurt Dick. I know it hurt Dick. You could just feel the fiber of the team pulling apart, and, and you know, it was spiraling out of control. That was the end of the, the, the Vermeil era. Right now, I'm going to take my own advice and step down out of coaching. I am emotionally burnt out. I hope very much my players can understand where I'm coming from. After 82, we were a bad football team, but we were a bad organization. The passion we had for the game, I think, clearly was hindered. And I think the, the, the feel that we had developed for each other uh, as an entire football organization was gone. The bottom fell out of his world. He needed something that was reassuring, something that was recognizable. So he clings to the green felt tables. Maybe they were his life raft. Of course, in the end, <laughs> they ended up being his Titanic. Gambling, once a hobby for Leonard Toes, now became the center of his life. The limousine would arrive, Leonard Toes would step out, all motion would stop in the casino, he would sit down at a table, they would cordon off the blackjack table. It was indeed a happening. Leonard was one of the, the most highly visible high rollers and one of the earliest high rollers in Atlantic City history. Could you describe what, would, what you would do on a night if you went to Atlantic City? Describe that scene? Oh, yeah. I'd bet 10,000 on each number, which is 70,000. You would play all the different hands? Yeah, seven yeah. hands, 10,000 a hand. What's the biggest that you lost in one night? Oh, something over a million, I guess. You know. He could lose a million dollars and would stand up and say, thank you very much, and walk away. Do you think that there's a certain machismo about losing that amount of money, that you could lose that amount of money and just sort of, I don't give a damn, and, and shrug it off? Actually, when I went home, I never knew how much I lost. You know. Why I not? I would find out the next day because I didn't keep track of it. How the hell would I keep track of a drinking and 
gambling. You don't know. You know, I don't know how many markers I signed. Oh. I was there, and I remember at the Sands, or this pit boss called the president of the Sands at like 2:30 in the morning when he was drunk to extend his line of credit another three or four hundred thousand dollars. That to me was unconscionable. Why they would do that uh, and take the man's money? Might as well put a gun to his head. I was just sick uh, at seeing this fortune being thrown away uh, on the roll of a card. You, you know, he wouldn't leave. This wouldn't leave. What happened when you were losing, and your friends would come up to you and they'd say, "Leonard, stop this! You're, you're, this is self-destructive." What would you do? So I get lost. I wasn't paying any attention to them. A couple times I tried to get him to stop gambling, and his answer to me was, what's the matter? Are you afraid there's not going to be enough left for you? I used to say to him, let's do something else. Why don't we go to a movie or something? He says, because they don't have chips in a movie. People are trying to help that, yeah. You kind of do what you want to do. I think the best thing you can say about it is stupidity. That's what it is. You know, how do you analyze? I guess I was one of those compulsive gamblers, and it didn't mix with the scotch. We finally called Dr. Custard. Dr. Custard was the one, by the way, who established compulsive gambling as a disease. Dr. Custer came to me and said, I met Leonard in a bar and he had a scotch in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and he said, what are you here for? And he said, I'm here to help you with your compulsive gambling. And Leonard said, hell, I beat smoking and drinking. What makes you think I can't beat gambling? When Dr. Custer came to see you, did, what did you think about that? Paying attention to him. No. He was a victim of his gaming habit, and as a result, he lost the thing he loved the most in life, the Philadelphia Eagles. Leonard Toes lost a reported $20 million gambling. In 1984, he was forced to sell the Eagles to Norman Brayman. I couldn't even face the guy. I really couldn't. I felt so sorry for him. Because here you are, the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, the prestige thing and everything, and it's worth a fortune. And you took the thing and dug a ditch and threw all the money in, and, and the team. Before his death in 2003, Leonard Toast lost a fortune along with four wives. In 1992, he sued the Sands Casino, but he lost the suit and eventually lost a lot more. He was evicted from his house. You had the sheriff's auction uh, of all the goods in his house. I mean, he was uh, almost a street person. You know, he lives in a hotel room, all cooped up and, uh, and not many people to visit with. It's, it's, it's very disappointing. You know, because I've, I've seen a guy at, at, at the top of the mountain. I remember Leonard Tosa as a pillar of strength, the leader of the Eagle organization, in fact, maybe the leader of the city of Philadelphia for a while. What is the most prized possession, Leonard, that you have? That's a pretty tough question. I don't know what it is. I try to maintain some pride and dignity. How do you go about maintaining the, 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 the pride and dignity at this I point? I don't face life? it all the time. You don't face it? Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, my lifestyle is not too good, and I don't face it. I just ignore it. He's on defense, but he has too much dignity. He's a guy who it's very hard to give him something back. Very hard. Very it was very easy for him to, to to give. Almost impossible for him to receive. A couple of years ago, Jimmy Murray, Caroline, and a bunch of your friends were going to put together this benefit dinner because they knew that, that you needed money. And what was your reaction to that? I wanted to shoot him. <clears throat> you wanted well, to shoot him? Yeah. Why? Nobody's going to raise a run of benefit for me. Where do you get money, Leonard, to live today? Oh, most of the money I've gotten is from Vermeil. Without asking, though. When I sensed he needed some money, I would try to help him. And not large sums of money, but enough to help him get through some problems and these kinds of things. But I never let him put himself in a position that he had to ask me. People will look at Leonard and say Leonard is a loser because he lost so much gambling or he lost his football team gambling. But really, Leonard, Leonard's legacy is so much more important. It's the people that he's helped, that he's nurtured, the people that will never forget him. 
The Eagles Fly for Leukemia Drive, which Tose established, is the most successful and far-reaching charity started by any sports franchise. There are hundreds of Ronald McDonald houses in dozens of countries, and the legacy continues. 30 years after she was stricken with leukemia and given a 20% chance of survival, Kim Hill is still alive and the mother of a healthy son. Leonard just didn't have the vision. Leonard had the love, and Leonard had the lasting power. And Leonard said, we're not gonna leave with a stone unturned. The saying I once heard that the idea of a perfect life was that your, your, your bankroll and your life run out at the same time. More than once, hell, <laughs> once is no fun. If I had a million dollars in cash and I put it on the table, would you end up with it down in Atlantic City? Probably charter a yacht and go to south of France first. He is a classic gambler, and he would try to take that million. He, he would never be a reformed gambler. He would try to make that into a way that he could buy back the Eagles. You think about the good old days, and, I, and I'm sure Leonard thinks about the good old days, and I think Leonard's personal tough part is the decisions that he knows that he made and put him in the position that he's in today. Uh, they were glory days for the Eagles, and uh, maybe he won't win a Super Bowl till the Lord opens the pearly gates and said, hey, I got something for you. What would you want your legacy to be? I tried. <laughs>